Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaska for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 7th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the HB 331 shell game. HB 331 is the proposal to issue state bonds to accelerate payment of oil tax credits. Seems good for current Alaskans, but the costs pop up and cost future Alaskans even more. Second, the the SB 26 conference committee proposal. SB 26 is the proposed state fiscal plan. In our view, it passed the conference committee proposal effectively spells the end of the PFD. And third, BP signs a gas sales deal with AGDC, the state's LNG arm. A small ray of sunshine in an otherwise bleak week. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Brad Keithley is with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, an organization dedicated to try and get the state to spend within its means, which I know is a very, very difficult thing, it seems to be. One of the hardest things It's like herding cats with a shotgun. Uh, and uh, Brad has been fighting this battle for many years. He comes on every week to discuss things with us, and we start off with his top three each week to discuss. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? You know, I cannot complain, my friend. I cannot complain. Let's talk about your top three today. <laughs> okay, well, the top three are uh, SB 26, which is the uh, uh, the the proposal, the, fisc- the, propo- the, the state's fiscal plan, the proposal to uh, uh, govern draws from the permanent fund and, and deal with the uh, permanent fund dividend or not deal with the permanent fund dividend, Uh, HB 331, which is the proposal uh, to uh, issue bonds and uh, collect a bunch of money uh, by issuing bonds and then pay that over to producers uh, to pay off the, accelerate the payments of the oil and gas tax credits. Uh, And then the third thing I want to talk about is the BP uh, contract with uh, AGDC, which I think is a a good thing uh, and, and a good sign uh, even though we don't know the terms, I, yeah, I've been in the industry long enough. I can sort of speculate at what these terms are. So uh, I think it's a, I, I think it's a good thing. But those are the top three things. All right. Well, let's. Uh, where do you want to start? You want to start out with SB twenty six or three thirty one? Let's start with three thirty one because that's that's the one that is still well. They're both it and SB twenty six are still in process, but HB three thirty one uh, is a significant uh, a significant concern to me. I, so HB three. So so let's go back to the beginning. The beginning is that we've got these oil and gas tax credits been around since two thousand and seven. Basically, the state set up a program that they were going to subsidize uh, uh, certain oil and gas producers, subsidize their activities of exploration um, uh, and and development of, of of new projects. The state invested uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six billion dollars. Uh, in the program, by the time it's all said and done, maybe seven billion dollars uh, in the program, giving money to producers to subsidize or to, to oil companies, not producers, to oil companies to subsidize uh, these activities. Uh, the program was set up in 2007, had uh, a repayment or had payment obligations in it by the state. It set up the mechanism the state was going to and how the state was going to pay uh, uh, these obligations. They, uh, the statute provided that when the state had high revenues uh, from uh, oil and gas uh, production, high production tax revenues, 
that it would pay a significant amount of these credits uh, over to the oil companies. Uh, but when the state had low revenues from production taxes, when prices went down or volumes went down or revenues otherwise went down from uh, oil and gas production taxes, the state didn't have as big an obligation to the companies. It could essentially stretch out that obligation. It was it was a trade-off. The companies got uh, got these subsidies. The state got uh, got certain things, but one of the things was uh, a repayment schedule that sort of matched the state's cash flow. So when the state had low cash flow, it didn't have to uh, pay as much in the credits. Fast forward to 2014. Um, uh, the the, the before 2014, the state pays a bunch of uh, pays a bunch of money uh, on these credits, sort of keeps current uh, with the with the incurrence of the credits by the by the companies. The companies make a spend, qualify for a subsidy. The state uh, 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 immediately hands over the money qualified for the credit. Fast fast forward to 2014, oil prices go down. Uh, the state's production levels are um, uh, at historic lows. Uh, and uh, and so production tax revenues are going down, and the state then first through the governor through governor vetoes uh, the legislature tried to continue to spend uh, give the companies higher amounts. The governor vetoed those amounts down, uh, and then through uh, uh, the state legislature, the state brings its payments in line with the statute down to the statutory uh, provisions. We've got low revenues coming in. From production taxes, we don't have to pay that much out uh, in the credits. It sort of stru- uh, 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 lengthens out the credits. The companies knew since 2007. Companies involved in this progr- program knew since 2007 that risk was there. If if production taxes went down, the state the the, the state's obligations would go down, and the period of time to recover the credits would go down. Um, so 2014, we hit this situation. The state's payments start going down. All of a sudden, the companies start complaining. Uh, oh my gosh, we thought we were always going to get paid high amounts. We thought we were always going to get reimbursed uh, what our <laughs> obligations were, um, and and so you're short paying us. Right. Um, the moose promised the us. The, was the moose promised us right. that we'd get paid. <laughs> Right. There was a cartoon involved in one of the state's presentations where all the, they had a moose, talking moose in this cartoon, and the, and the moose said, we would always have your back. So the companies take this this cartoon and other things, and they say, you said you'd always have our back. Uh, you, you know, And so that, that means you have to pay us right now. You have to pay us as, as we're incurring these costs. Not what the statute said, not what they signed up for for the agreement, uh, but they start complaining. And now, and, and so fast forward from 20, 2014 when this starts hitting to, to now 2018, and the companies have sort of built up this drumbeat, right? You owe us this money, uh, and, and, and we need to get this money now, and we're not going to be able to do you know, things to develop these fields if we don't have this money now. And we borrowed money from banks, and they want their money now, and they're charging us interest on this money now, and we want our money now. Uh, and so... 331 HB 331 is is a bill that essentially you know, this a bill created by the administration where the administration says all right we'll give you your, your money now and in fact to give you your money now what we're going to do is we're going to go out and borrow a bunch of money the state's going to go out and issue bonds borrow a bunch of money and we're going to give all that money to you right now uh, we're not going to I'm sorry no I didn't say anything go ahead Oh, and we're we're not going. Must be in the feedback loop or something. Oh, okay, sorry. We're, we're gonna we're we're not going to um, uh, we're not going to continue with the statute. Uh, we're going to give you a bunch of this money now. Um, and and three thirty one was born of that. Frankly, I didn't give it much weight at the beginning of the session uh, because I, I'm, the state doesn't owe this money. Right. Why would we go be going out and borrowing money? Why would we use be using the state's credit? Going out and borrowing money um, uh, and incurring, you know, shifting the risk of interest costs to us uh, and and creating this this repayment obligation down the road plus interest. Why would we be doing that uh, when we have a statute that tells us, you know, how to how to make these payments? And and the producers agreed to from the outset of the program as one of the conditions of getting these subsidies. Uh, but as the legislature has gone along, as this session's gone on. Um, uh, the, the drumbeat for this program, uh, has, has built up and up and up 
frankly, driven by the oil industry, some in the oil industry, and driven by some in the oil field service sector, uh, who would be beneficiaries of of, uh, of additional activity this might generate. Um, and the drumbeat has has increased uh, for these bonds. And and now the latest, you know, the most recent development last week is the Republicans uh, in the House appeared to trade. Uh, their vote for the, the, the CBR draw to get this bill passed. Uh, so we have a, a deal in the, in, the, in, the, in the House last session where 331, this bill to, to, to borrow funds, uh, has, uh, it, it comes up to the legislature, comes, comes through House Finance, comes up to the House floor, and, uh, and Republicans provide most of the votes uh, to pass 331. There were some Democrats involved. But Republicans uh, provide most of the votes uh, to pass 331. Right, and Just, course, it's it's an amazing thing to me. We can we can talk about we can talk about the costs to Alaskans that this bill creates, but but that's sort of the backstory for how we've gotten to where we are. Right, and what I really want to point out is that it was at the last minute that this analysis seemed to pop up all over the web, and and of course became part of the talking points from Ed King, who we've quoted on this program before. <laughs> Uh, who's done some good analysis on things like PFD and other things. But this analysis that he did on the HB 331 and the bonding um, was very, very much sunshine and best case scenario and left out a lot of factors that, uh, but, but they immediately pointed to this to say, see, the state will now make money on this deal. We need to do this because the state will make money. Yeah. Well, this is the theory. I mean, the theory that, that's that's inherent in Ed's piece and the administration's been pushing is is what what we're going to do with these bonds is we're going to go out and we're going to borrow a lot of money at relatively low cost. Uh, uh, some people claimed it was three percent. It's not. It's a, the the state assumed five percent, which is the state's embedded cost of debt. Uh, but we're going to go out and borrow money. And and Ed's analysis says, well, if we if we borrow that money and pay this stuff off, but we keep the same amount of money, we don't have to make these payments that we otherwise were obligated to make. We can defer making these payments until we pay off the debt. We're going to be able to generate uh, an 8% or a 9% return by keeping this money in the earnings reserve uh, and using this borrowed money instead. Uh, and and the effect, of, the timing effect of being able to not have to make the statutory payments being able to use the borrowed money and keep uh, the money that we otherwise were going to use for the statutory payments and the earnings reserve, th- that's going to generate an, a, generate an 8% return or a 9% return. And the spread between the 5% return we're paying for the borrowed money and the 8 or 9% that we're getting from the earnings reserve will generate additional money for the state, which essentially pays these bonds off um, or pays the interest costs off. And the state ends up to the good uh, by the end of this program, or by the end of the payout period, which is 2031, right? Uh, now, now extended by the bonds. But that, I mean, that analysis is good as far as it goes, but it overlooks, in my mind, overlooks one big thing <laughs> that is a truism about Alaska, yep. uh, and, and particularly about the Alaska legislature. When you when you reduce costs someplace, the effect of these bonds will be. Uh, to be to fund the credits and to reduce the amount of payments uh, uh, the legislature or the state has to make uh, annually uh, uh, under the under the statutory credit program. Instead of paying roughly 180 million dollars this year, to, yeah, 180 million dollars this year, uh, as as we were obligated to do under the statutory credit program, the legislature will only have to pay the 30 million dollars toward the bonds. One of the things the bonds do. Is, is shift the cost, shift the payment obligations from current Alaskans out to future Alaskans. Um, and so it, on, that, on that difference between the $180 million uh, that we otherwise would have had to pay in credits and the $30 million uh, that we will have to pay on the bonds, that $150 million, as analysis is, we assume that will stay in the earnings reserve and generate, generate earnings. The right. problem with that is in Alaska, when we reduce costs like that, we go spend the money on something else, right? Um, right. And and if you if you assume that that we're going to have these savings, quote savings of the difference between 180 million dollars and 30 million dollars, that 150 million dollars is going to show up being spent on someplace else. Once you do that, 
any benefit that, that's incorporated in Ed's analysis goes out the window. Uh, and in fact, we start losing money hand over fist um, uh, in this program. So that analysis that, that everybody, that, that legislators touted, Lance Pruitt said, you know, in the, in the House Finance Committee, it was a great thing. And some people said on the floor it was a great thing. Some of the blogs, Must Read Alaska, said it was a great thing. That analysis is entirely predicated on something the legislature doesn't do. Right. Well, which and, is, which is, and historically which is not done, which historically is not done. I mean, we talk specifically about the annual required contribution, the ARC, to the Persiters program. That was a required contribution that they had set when they made the tier change and said you must spend or pay into the account this much each year to keep it solvent, to keep it going, to keep it funded, to do all these things. And in only two out of 10 years did they actually hit that number. In the other eight years, they directed the money somewhere else. They spent it on something else. They've got a track record of not saving, but instead spending the money not on things they're required to, but on things that they want to. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, the way the legislature uh, uh, thinks about these things, you can look at the Senate's um, uh, 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 spending cap bill uh, as an example of this. They set a number uh, uh, of that bill. I think says four four billion or four point one billion or something like that. They set a number that they can spend up to, right? And and basically, what you'd have to say for for Ed's now for Ed's theory uh, to work, you'd have to say, okay, instead of spending that four point one, we're going to spend four point one less the savings that we're going to get out of this all tax credit bill. So instead of spending 4.1, we're going to spend 150, 150 million less this year. We're going to spend 3.95 uh, uh, billion dollars. They never do that. They never do that through various tricks. I mean, I mean, sometimes outright, but certainly through various accounting tricks, they always get back up to that 4.1, if not beyond it. They always, right. they always funnel the money that they otherwise say they're savings from some program and uh, into other spending. I mean, we've got we've got bills right now to increase K through 12 funding uh, by $100 is in the House, $100 uh, to the BSA is in the House bill. The Senate has proposed just a $30 million, $30 million grant uh, to, to K through 12 as as their proposal. They're just they're just using the, the savings that they're generating out of some programs and they're spending it. They're spending it uh, on other programs. Once you do that, once you once you convert those savings into additional spending, but spending on something else, the whole theory of the bonds are going to make us money uh, goes out the window. And 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 we end up. I did an analysis. It's, it's on uh, on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. The link to it uh, is there. I did an analysis that extended Ed's analysis on out and looked at what happens. Uh, if they, if the legislature in fact spends this so-called savings, if they spend all of it, instead of being six hundred million dollars to the good, which is what Ed's analysis was, we end up nine hundred million dollars, nearly a billion dollars to the bad. That is, we spend a billion dollars more with this bond package than we would have if we would have uh, just continued to comply with the statute and uh, and made the statutory payments until. Uh, uh, until we until the program was 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 fully paid for. Uh, yeah. Even if you assume, even if you assume the legislature only spends half that savings, only fifty percent of the savings. I wanted to test the number to see if there was some percentage in there that 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 worked. Even if you assume they only spend half the savings, if they somehow go against history and manage to save the other half of the savings, um, even if they only assume half, you're still to the bad. Uh, Ninety million dollars, nearly a hundred million dollars. That is, you've spent more. Uh, uh, Alaskans have spent more over time on by doing the bond package than they would have had they had they ridden out the uh, ridden out the current statute. So, it, yeah, Ed's analysis is good. It, it's only though good as far as it goes, and it sort of ends up in a hypothetical of what if the legislature managed to go in, go against history and managed to set aside these funds. Never have, never will. Even if this legislature would tell you they're going to do that, this legislature can't bind the ne next legislature. And and you look at history, and no legislature has ever been able to to restrain itself from from spending those savings that they've that they've generated in another period. So it's 
the bond, no analysis, no analysis shows that the bond package is good for Alaskans. All that it shows is it gives oil companies a bunch of money up front that the statute didn't provide for. And all that it shows is it lowers the cost to current Alaskans because all current Alaskans are going to pay for is these coupons on the bonds for the next few years. But when we have to, when the big payments start kicking in, will be the next generation of Alaskans in the 2020s. And so this, all the, all the bond package has done is shifted the cost out of this generation into the next generation of Alaskans. Right. And again, that with his pie in the sky, very rosy eyed, all rose colored glasses analysis, when you actually inform it on historicals and actions of this legislator, legislature historically, they've effectively stretched out the payments an additional seven or eight years, and it will cost us somewhere between a hundred and a million and almost a billion dollars, depending on how much they spend. But I fully expect them to spend all of it because that has been their historical track record. And nobody and nobody's talk. No news outlet has done this kind of analysis. No, no, uh, you know, investigative reporter has been asking this. Nobody really, except for us, has been talking about this. This is the biggie. The second biggie is, of course, the other eight million pound elephant in the room that's going to jump up and down in our chest in the in the late twenties, and that, of course, is the PERS and TERS obligation, which I mentioned earlier, which we have been underfunding for years. That's going to rear its ugly head right about the same time all this other stuff comes to a head. Yeah, exactly right. So when you look out, when you look out to the twenty twenties, what we, what this legislature and and the previous legislature that dealt with PERS and TERS, what if they passed HB three eleven or three thirty one, the the old tax credit bill. What this legislature and the previous legislatures have done is commit for in the 2020s, they've already committed 20 percent of the estimated uh, UGF revenues, unrestricted general fund revenues, the traditional revenues we look at when we do analyses in the state. <coughs> Excuse me. This legislature and the previous legislatures will have already committed 20 percent of those revenues, UGF revenues in 2024, 2025, 2026, and, and into the late 2020s and early 2030s, already committed 20% to pay off costs that this generation uh, uh, should have been paying for. They just kicked the can down the road. Basically, <coughs> excuse me, basically, this legislature has passed a tax on future Alaskans by creating a situation using so much of the of, of future revenues to pay off these these obligations, creating a situation in which future Alaskans can't uh, 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 pay for these things without either deeper P PFD cuts, if we have a PFD by then, or uh, imposing taxes on themselves. This legislature has passed that on to, uh, to our children. And again, nobody is talking about these scenarios or these, these potentials here, and that to me is – is the most terrifying. It's like everybody's just nodding their head up and down and saying, oh, yeah, great idea. Let's move forward and do that, um, which to me is just, you know, betting on the best case scenario for these things is never a good idea, in my opinion. Um, so where does where does 331 go now? And now it's in front of the Senate. What What's happening here? 331 is over in the Senate. It has a hearing before Senate finance uh, today. Uh, the Senate has always been in favor of this program. Uh, as as a means of paying off oil companies early, the Senate has been um, traditionally more receptive to the oil company claims of the moose, the talking moose claims, um, and so uh, it goes to Senate Finance. Presumably, Senate Finance will approve it. Goes to the Senate floor. If they make any changes, if the Senate makes any changes to it, uh, it'll have to come back to the House for concurrence. If the Senate just enacts it the way the House sent it over. Uh, then it'll go to the governor for signature. It's it's essentially, I mean, the only place this was going to stop, and the place I never thought it would get out of was the house. House finance. Uh, yeah. But it got out. It got out of the house uh, as a result of Republican votes. It's just amazing to me, Michael. These are Republicans who've said for years. We want to, we're the party that's going to control costs. We're the party that's going to stop kicking the can down the road. We're the party that's going to be fiscally responsible. We're the party that's going to, you know, where the buck's going to stop uh, and we're going to stop it. 
And and when they got put in the minority uh, in the 2016 elections, they said, you know, we're going to bring up all these cost saving measures. We're going to bring up all these amendments to the budget, uh, and and we're going to you know try to drive try to drive costs down. Yet when push came to shove, when push came to shove, it's the Republicans uh, that pa- the House Republicans that passed. Uh, 331. And if you want to put an even finer point on it, the great irony out of all this uh, is the only time the Matsu delegation, the Matsu Republican delegation, has had any impact this legislature. I mean, they've, they've talked a good game. They've talked about bringing down costs. They've, they've proposed amendments. But the only time they've had any impact this legislature is in voting for 331, in voting for this oil tax credit bonding bill. Four of the six of the Matsu leg- Republican legislators voted for it. That was the margin of victory uh, of that proposal in the House. What that does is kick costs down the road, imposes a tax increase on the next generation of Alaskans, and it's the Matsu four four Matsu Republicans who were the ones that did that. I, you know, I'm just sitting there with my eyes just wide open watching them do this um, and trying to reconcile that to the to the rhetoric that they've been talking about. Not only this session, but but all sessions past. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. Again, I I don't have high hopes. I think again we've just burdened our future generations with more, which leads us over, I guess, to the second one. Unless you have any other thoughts on this, but it leads us over to SB twenty six. Yeah, you know, let's let's go to SB twenty six. SB twenty six is the proposed uh, fiscal plan. Uh, that was originally proposed by the governor at the start of the last session uh, in 2017, uh, got through the Senate, was reformed and got through the Senate uh, as a proposal to restructure the permanent fund uh, in a way to, to, for the state to take funds from the, from the permanent fund earnings account. Um, and, and then it went over to the House. The House added an income tax on it said if you're going to do these permanent fund cuts or it cuts the permanent fund dividend the sentence version cuts the permanent fund dividend went over to the house the house said if you're going to uh, enact these permanent fund dividend cuts then we need to have an income tax on it sent it back over to the senate uh and uh the senate failed to concur and so it went to conference committee and that's where it ended uh last session in 2017 now we come to 2018 the it didn't that that bill sort of sat there in conference committee Almost the entire session uh, in the last couple of weeks, it's resurfaced, um, and there seems to be a drive on to finish SB 26. Conference committee has been working on it. Uh, the conference committee met on on it this morning. I understand they passed it out. So whatever bill they passed out is now going to go to both houses uh, for a vote. Uh, if both houses vote in favor of it, uh, then then it's enacted. The version. I doubt if they changed it this morning, but the version that was on the table uh, when the conference committee met this morning uh, would have a, would establish a, a percent of market value draw on the permanent fund, uh, and and about a five five point two five percent for the first two years, and then five percent uh, thereafter would be the draw. That's not the part that bothers me. That's really that, that's sort of a different way of doing what we've been doing. We've been doing it based upon, the statute's been based on statutory net income, uh, uh, less inflation proofing. This is a different way of really doing inflation proofing. So it's not the, it's not the POMV method that bothers me so much, but what they did uh, with the PFD statute, the permanent fund dividend statute uh, is, is, is a big thing. What they did was change the wording of the PFD statute from the permanent fund corporation shall deposit into the permanent fund dividend account each year uh, 50% of the earn or 50% of statutory net income, the earnings stream coming from the permanent fund. Change that language from shall to may. Right. And and has created a situation in which the legislature will now determine, the governor and the legislature will now determine basically on a year-to-year basis what the PFD is. And we've seen as push has come to shove between cutting spending or controlling spending, uh, as push has come to shove between controlling spending and the PFD, the legislature is the PFD that the legislature has has given up. They've they've cut it. Uh, 
the governor originally cut it through a veto. Legislature last year cut it through uh, through the appropriations process. This year, they're cutting it through the appropriations process. When push comes to shove, between spending, controlling spending, uh, and uh, and and preserving the PFD, it's the PFD that's given away. So, I think we've seen the beginning. If SB 26 goes through, I think we've seen the beginning of the end of the PFD. It may take a few years to get there, but when, when when the legislative process occurs and somebody comes in and says, oh, well, you can't cut K through 12 because that's for the children, or you can't cut the university because that's you know, that's where our learning is going, or you can't cut uh, uh, Medicaid because, uh, because we've got people dependent on Medicaid, and you certainly can't cut state employees because that's a bunch of jobs. Um, um, when those when 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 those targeted defenses of, of of spending come in play, the legislature's decided to cut the PFD to to fund those. That will that will be something that just continues in the next few years. It'll be we started with a PFD of of fifty percent. Then it was the governor cut it down, and then the legislature cut it down. The legislature's cutting it down this year, and gradually, little by little, they'll come up with excuses to say, oh well. But, you know, we've got to maintain K through 12 funding or at some point they're going to say we've got to have a capital uh, budget to maintain, maintain all these construction jobs or or the better articulation, at least the more reasonable articulation is we've got buildings falling apart. One by one, you will see, we will see justifications coming in for cutting the PFD a little bit more. And, and the way the statute sets it up, five years, six years, seven years, it's gone. And, of course, the big question here is will it get passed? In the next two days, because we have a deadline uh, in the, uh, of course, the, the House or the uh, the legislature has a, a statutory deadline of 90 days. They've blown past that. They have a constitutional deadline of 121 days, which makes it like the 12th. But we've got a window because citizens have already talked about a referendum on this bill, SB 26. There's been a referendum in the works since last year when it came forward. But there's also a mechanism in the Constitution <laughs> That says for referendums they have to be they have to be on laws that were passed 180 days before the general election. If they don't get this done by the by the next day or so, and they pass it, it will be two years before the next general election that we'll be allowed to have a referendum on this issue. And that is that is the big scare here is that people are afraid that's part of the end game. What what say you? Oh, it is part of the end game. I mean. There, there's some question right now whether SB 26 passes, um, probably passed the Senate because it's the Senate's original idea. Not not quite clear how the House is going to shake up. I mean, the House has gone unpredictable. The, the vote for 331 was just shocking. So I don't know what the hell, what the heck's going on in the House. Uh, but but probably uh, it will pass both bodies. But it's, but they're not going to bring it to the floor essentially tomorrow. It has to be. It's either. Uh, it, if it's going to be enacted, uh, if, the, if, if there's going to be an initi- a, a referendum on, on, on the bill this coming fall, uh, it, there has to be an up and down vote, uh, or, or the legislature has to adjourn, excuse me, legislature has to adjourn tomorrow. Not going to happen. Um, legislature's not going to adjourn tomorrow. There's too much, too much hanging out there. So they've managed to push it uh, uh, past the window. Uh, we, have, we, have, we will lose the opportunity to have a referendum on and that means that Alaskans will be stuck with whatever they have put in place for at least two years. Um, and and who knows what's going to happen. Again, all we can do to inform future behavior is to look at past behavior. And we've seen what they've done. They have been very, very poor managers of our money. They've made poor decisions. They've spent well beyond their means to continue to do so. They use voodoo accounting by moving stuff from one account to another, saying that they're cutting over here. But in this, in this, in the sense, when it's all said and done, the actual outflow from the state coffers is greater than ever before. All while we're having a recession, all while everybody out there in the private sector is struggling to get by, and they just don't seem to be in touch with what's happening. No, they they they've essentially the legis- this legislature or this governor made the decision that we know better than than Alaskans. We know better how to spend the money. We know better how to direct the economy. Uh, government knows better how to direct the economy, knows better where the money's put than Alaskan. So instead of putting Alaskan, uh, instead of putting this money in Alaskans' hands uh, through the PFD and let Alaskans making decisions, making decisions about where they want uh, to spend the money, uh, the government has decided to cut it. 
uh, cut the PFD, keep the money inside government, and for government to make the decisions, like HB 331, which essentially is to pay a bunch of money to oil companies earlier than the statute requires. Or, you know, going back, like building the, the University of Alaska Anchorage um, uh, athletic arena, or like building two engineering buildings. That's basically where your PFD's gone. They spent the money they should have been saving um, uh, uh, back in the 2014 time period, 2010 to 2014 time period, spent the money they should have been saving that would enable us to continue to have the PFD now. Uh, they spent it on those things, essentially shifted the burden to future Alaskans. Those that, that, that generation of Alaskans, that period of Alaskans, got to party like it was 1999. They got to build things. They had construction contracts. They had all sorts of uh, programs going on. Um, and, but essentially, you know, by not saving money then, shifted the burden to this generation. Well, not only is this generation now, not only is this generation of legislators now deciding to take the PFD so that government can have more money and pay government things, this generation is now kicking the can to make matters even worse, is now kicking the can down to the next generation, down to the 2020s through 331, essentially making sure that when we get to that generation, they're not going to have a PFD, um, and, and they're going to have to have taxes to, to pay for those things. It has been one since 2010, basically, is when we started going down this hole. It has been one step of fiscal mis mismanagement over another, and, and the legislators who were there during that period, in charge during that period, people who are now running for governor like Mike Chenault or running for lieutenant governor like Kevin Meyer, those people are the ones that had put us into this situation, and they're the ones that are voting to make it even worse into the 2020s. Which, again, raises the question of that insanity thing, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That is, I mean, we just can't, we can't continue in that in that direction. Um we're uh, we've got one more item. Any final thoughts here on twenty six? As to, I mean, if there's anything we can do. I heard last night. I got a comment from a couple of people who are kind of in the know with their ear to the ground in Juno. I hear that there's not enough votes to pass it, but I haven't been able to do a head count of twenty to say no. So I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I after three thirty one, after HB three thirty one, I don't know how to I don't know how to predict votes. I'm not sure anybody knows how to predict votes uh, down there right now. It, it will be. I mean, the, the thing that will stop HB twenty six if it is if people uh, like you and others say, "Look, this is the end of the PFD. You pass this thing, and you wipe out the shall in that statute." And you essentially give over to the legislature the right to determine what the PFD is going to be uh, compared to spending levels, and the PFD is gone. So you, if you if you vote for SB 26 when it comes back to the full floor out of the conference committee, if you vote for it, you, Mia Costello, vote for it. You, um, uh, uh, Ivy Sponholtz, vote for it. You're voting to end the PFD. If people, if if we can make that point then there's a chance that it gets defeated probably on the House side. But if people, if people say, as Mia Costello is trying to say um, uh, disingenuously, if they say, oh, we're, we're saving the PFD, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're keeping the PFD in the statute, uh, the words permanent fund dividend in the statute, we're saving the PFD. If, if they get away with that explanation, uh, then they'll pass SB 26 and, and, and we'll be done for in five or six years. All right. Well, you're so cheery. You just make my day so bright and sunshiny. It's it's astonishing. Let's let's talk about the the final three of your weekly top three, and that would be the apparently historic deal between BP and AGDC reaching a North Slope gas deal. Yeah, I'm not sure historic's the right word for it, but I think important step uh, is probably the right word for it. We we don't know what the terms of the deal are. I mean, it's been kept confidential for, frankly, to what, what to me as an oil and gas lawyer are obvious reasons. You don't want your competitors knowing, uh, uh, BP doesn't want its competitors knowing what it's, what it's agreed to um, uh, in terms. The state's still negotiating, negotiating with ConocoPhillips, uh, with Exxon, and with other uh, minor interests 
uh, minor ownership interests on the North Slope of, of North Slope Gas, uh, and so BP doesn't want the, the others knowing. Frankly, the state, as a as a purchaser, doesn't want others knowing as well. If they can strike a better deal with somebody else from the state standpoint, they don't want to have publicized the BP deal. the The important thing in the BP announcement is are two things. Two things triggered triggered my smile, frankly, my 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 view that this was a good thing. One was the statement they agreed on price. One of the one of the key indicators of whether you've really got a deal or not is is whether you agree on price. And and the the press release and both BP and the state have said they agreed on price. That's that that's a big thing. BP's interest in Prudhoe, in the Prudhoe gas fee, in the in, in gas on the North Slope in general, Prudhoe and Point Thompson combined, that that interest, BP's interest in gas, is the largest undeveloped asset, gas asset that BP has globally. That's a big deal. If they've agreed on the price at which they're willing to sell that, that's a big step. And if the state has, and if and if BP is comfortable with what that whatever the price provisions are. That's a big step. The second thing in that press release that I think is important or in the press surrounding it is, is, is Bob Dudley, who's the CEO of, B, of BP globally, Bob D- Dudley having his name associated with it and being quoted in connection with, with the release. Um, Dudley doesn't do that. Dudley doesn't go out and, um, and put his name to things lightly. It, he he will do that when it's a big deal to BP, big D, big B, BP, big deal to BP overall, um, and and he'll do it. I mean, he's concerned about credibility like everybody else. He'll only do it if he thinks it's a real deal. Um, the fact that they that they've agreed on price, and the fact that Bob Dudley was involved in the press release um, uh, and has endorsed this deal uh, gives gives an indication that BP believes it's a big deal. There's still risks. I mean, so the state's now going to be a purchaser, um, and and as a purchaser and and also the seller of the LNG, the state needs to be very concerned, and we need to be very concerned. The state doesn't get caught in a squeeze between buying high and selling low right. and losing money. Right. So there are things still to be concerned about, but but in terms of a step. Um, uh, this gas sales contract, because of those two terms, because of price uh, and because of Bob Dudley, those two terms, this deal is a, is, is, is a real deal and looks like a significant step in the progression of uh, AGDC's program. Now, Kathy Giesel was quoted in the KTVA story that I played earlier as saying, well, we don't see price. We don't see this. We, I'm not, you know, we're not sure as to how much influence does the Senate and the House uh, you know, resources committees have on this deal moving forward other than you know partially being the funding mechanism for agc and other things what um you know what what kind of what kind of sway are these resource committees going to have on this well they're gonna i mean ultimately the legislature has the ability to stop the lng project if if they decide it's the right thing to do um and and certainly uh their concerns need to be taken into account, need to be responded to, and ultimately they need to be persuaded it's the right deal. Yep, we don't see what the price is, um, and and you know one could one could be concerned that if you don't see the price, you don't know what the deal is. But I, but personally, I don't need to see the price to 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 to, to believe to speculate it's a good deal. Um, if if it's BP saying it, BP saying they've agreed to price, and Bob Dudley's putting his name behind it, that strikes me as as being a good deal. Now, some would say, well, that's a good deal for the producers, but but how do we know that's a good deal for the state? And we don't know yet. We don't know what the what the sales price the state's going to the state's going to have, uh, and we don't know what the what the cost of shipping is going to be. So we don't know if the state is putting itself at risk of being squeezed. So yeah, there there's still risks involved but having a supply and having agreed on price to a supply is a critical component of putting the entire package together sometimes you you don't know what you can set what you what you need to be focused on in terms of selling or in terms of in terms of how much money you've got to spend on kit until you know what your purchase price is if they if they've got that done uh that's a big deal and and 
from the flip side, I would say this. I don't think BP enters into deals they don't think are going to work. I mean, that's just not that's just not their MO. And certainly they don't put Bob Dudley's name to it if they if in entering into a deal they not that they don't think is going to work. So BP entering into this deal, determining price, that's that's a pretty good sign that BP thinks that the LNG project is going to work. They wouldn't be committing volume. They wouldn't be agreeing on price if they didn't think this overall deal was going to work. A lot of issues still to be concerned about, a lot of issues still to focus on. But this is a significant step, and frankly, in a week that's otherwise pretty damn dark because of because of uh, uh, the other things the legislature is doing, probably a small ray of sunshine into the week. Overall, your thoughts on the gas line, because I know that there's a lot of people out there that are concerned. It's a boondoggle, that it really won't be economical, that the people of Alaska will be on the hook for it. Your overall thoughts on those kind of concerns uh, for oil for uh, for a gas line in the state of Alaska? Well, LNG is growing. The, the 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 global demand for LNG is growing. It's growing primarily in the Pacific Rim, which is where Alaska is located. It's growing in China, um, uh, stable in the Japan, stable in Korea, growing uh, dramatically in China, um, and and Alaska has a lot of LNG that's that's logistically well placed to be able to penetrate the market. We've got challenges. We've got to build, you know, forty billion dollars of kit to get it from Prudhoe down to uh, uh, down to uh, where we can on tidewater where we can sell it to people. Um, but Alaska's got advantages as well. We got a lot of we got a lot of gas. We know where it is. We don't have exploration risk, um, uh, and we're and we're closely placed to the Far Eastern market. Somebody's going to be selling additional LNG. Somebody's going to be um, uh, putting, uh, uh, meeting this increased Chinese demand. Um, the the Gulf, U.S. Gulf Coast is trying to gear up to do that. Uh, Australia has, has built some plants. They've got some capacity they can, they can add on to that. Uh, but somebody's going to be meeting that increased demand. There's going to be increased LNG sales. Alaska's position to do it We've got challenges to achieve it, but we're positioned to do it, and I think it's well worth the cost of pursuing that objective because the payoff to Alaskans from that objective is is significant uh, in terms not only of immediate jobs, which is what Walker tends to focus on more, but in terms of the long-term payout of of, uh, of, of royalties production taxes on that on those gas sales, as well as the incentive for additional development uh, of new supplies. So uh, this is another step in the process, a good step in the process, a lot of challenges ahead, but I think we're, I think we're still on track uh, to play a role in, in meeting that increased demand. All right, Brad, let's do the wrap up. We've run a little bit long here, but I got you talking about beer uh, beforehand. So I guess we're, we're all, we're all even here. <laughs> Let's uh, let's think. So where are we at? We're finishing up the session. We're going to lose the referendum process. SB 26 may or may not pass. 331 has passed. We may potentially be moving forward on a gas line. What do Alaskans need to do? What do they need to know? What needs to happen from here? Well, they need to be very concerned about their legislators. They need to be very concerned about the fiscal decisions their legislators have made uh, this last session. Uh, and, and are continuing to make. 331 is, is still in process. SB 26 is still in process. If they're concerned, if they want to preserve the PFD, if they're concerned about what the legislature is doing about legislature's doing about the PFD, they need to write their legislators right now and say, keep the PFD as it is. That's the, that's the best message you can send uh, to legislators who are going to confront the SB 26 uh, conference committee vote. And then as we've talked about on this program a lot, Michael, we need to change the players. These guys, these guys and, and, and women have proved, generally speaking, have proved, generally speaking, not to be good managers of Alaska's fiscal condition. They, they are kicking the can down the road to the next generation. They're taking money out of the hands of Alaskans, essentially a tax uh, in order to increase government control over where, where Alaska money goes. Uh, they've not been good stewards of Alaska's fiscal condition. We need to change the players uh, in the coming in the coming in the coming election cycle. But right now, the best thing people can do is to write notes to their legislators saying, "Keep the PFD as it is. Vote no on SB 26. 
And if you want to add something on to the Senate, vote no on SB 331. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, we posted some links in the uh, Facebook chat for those that want to follow his uh, his commentary on his Medium page and everything else. Brad, thanks so much for coming in and joining us. We appreciate you being a part of the program today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate the, uh, appreciate the help. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.